Hello guys and welcome back to my channel. In this video we will be learning about the shoulder joint. To begin with, the shoulder joint is a synovial joint of ball and socket variety. The joint is formed by the articulation of the glenoid cavity of the scapula bone and the head of the humerus bone. Therefore, it is also called glenohumeral articulation. It is a weak joint but permits great mobility. The stability of this joint is maintained by three structures. First is the coracoacromial arch, the musculotendinous cuff of the shoulder and the glenoidal labrum. Now let me briefly explain to you what these three structures are. Firstly, we have the coracoacromial arch. Now as you can see here, this is the coracoid process and this is the acromion process of the scapula. Now the coracoacromial arch is a protective arch formed by the smooth inferior aspect of the acromion process right here and the coracoid process of the scapula with the coracoacromial ligament spanning in between them as you can see right here. This osseo ligamentous structure overlies the head of the humerus preventing its upward displacement from the glenoid cavity. The second structure is the musculotendinous cuff which is a supporting and strengthening structure of the shoulder joint that is made up of the part of its capsule blended with the tendons of the subscapularis the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus and the teres minor muscles as they pass to the capsule or across it to insert onto the humerus. The third structure is the glenoidal labrum. The glenoid labrum as you can see right here is a fibrocartilaginous structure attached around the margin of the glenoid cavity as you can see right here. Now concising the important points of the introduction to the shoulder joint we can see that the type is that the shoulder joint is a synovial joint of the ball and socket variety. The articular surface, the joint is formed by the articulation of the glenoid cavity of the scapula medially and the head of the humerus laterally. Therefore, it is also called the glenohumeral articulation. It is a weak joint but permits great mobility. The stability of the joint is maintained by three structures that is the coracoacromial arch, the musculotendinous cuff of the shoulder and the glenoidal labrum which helps in the deepening of the glenoidal force. Nextly, let's move on to the ligaments of the shoulder joint. We have four main ligaments. The first is the capsular ligament, second the coracohumeral ligament, third the transverse humeral ligament and finally the fourth is the glenoidal labrum. So let's look at the first ligament that is the capsular ligament. It is very loose and permits free movement. It is least supported inferiorly where dislocations are common that damages the axillary nerve. Medially it is attached to the scapula beyond the supraglenoid tubercle right here and also the margins of the labrum as you can see. Now laterally it is attached to the anatomical neck of the humerus. Now this is the lateral view of the right shoulder joint without the humerus in place so you can see the glenoid cavity. Now talking about the capsule anteriorly the capsule is reinforced by supplemental bands called the superior middle and inferior glenohumeral ligaments. The area between the superior and the middle glenohumeral ligament is a point of weakness in the capsule called the foramen of weight breached, which is a common site of anterior dislocation of the humeral head. Moving on to the next ligament, we have the coracohumeral ligament. It extends from the root of the coracoid process to the neck of the humerus opposite the greater tubercle. It gives strength to the capsule. Next we have the transverse humeral ligament. It bridges the upper part of the bicipital groove as you can see here. The tendon of the long head of the biceps brachii passes deep into the ligament. Finally we have the glenoidal labrum as I had explained earlier. 
It is a fibrocartilaginous rim which covers the margin of the glenoid cavity. It increases the depth of the cavity. Now concising the main points under ligaments, firstly we have the capsular ligament. It is very loose and permits free movement. It is least supported inferiorly where dislocations are common that damages the axillary nerve. Medially, the capsule is attached to the scapula beyond the supraglenoid tubercle and the margins of the labrum. Laterally, it is attached to the anatomical neck of the humerus. Anteriorly, the capsule is reinforced by the supplemental bands called the superior, middle and inferior glenohumeral ligaments. The area between the superior and middle glenohumeral ligament is a point of weakness in the capsule, foramen of weight breached, which is a common site of anterior dislocation of the humeral head. The coracohumeral ligament. It extends from the root of the coracoid process to the neck of the humerus, opposite the greater tubercle. It gives strength to the capsule. The transverse humeral ligament, it bridges the upper part of the bicipital groove of the humerus. The tendon of the long head of the biceps brachii passes deep to the ligament. Finally, the glenoidal labrum. It is a fibrocartilaginous rim which covers the margin of the glenoid cavity, thus increasing the depth of the cavity. Moving on to the bursae related to the joint, we have the subacromial bursa, the subscapularis bursa and the infraspinatus bursa. Moving on to the relations of the shoulder joint, superiorly the shoulder joint is related to the coracoacromial arch, the subacromial bursa as you can see here, the supraspinatus muscle, you can see the tendon of the supraspinatus right here and the deltoid muscle. Inferiorly, the shoulder joint is related to the long head of the triceps as you can see here, the axillary nerves and the posterior circumflex humeral artery. Anteriorly, the shoulder joint is related to the subscapularis muscle as you can see right here, the coracobrachialis muscle, the short head of the biceps brachii and the deltoid muscle. Posteriorly, the shoulder joint is related to the infraspinatus muscle, the teres minor muscle and the deltoid. Now, concising the main points under the relations of the shoulder joint, we have superiorly, the shoulder joint is related to the coracoacromial arch, the subacromial bursa, the supraspinatus and the deltoid. Inferiorly, it is related to the long head of the triceps, axillary nerves and the posterior circumflex humeral artery. Anteriorly, it is related to the subscapularis, the coracobrachialis, short head of the biceps brachii and the deltoid. Posteriorly, it is related to the infraspinatus, teres minor and the deltoid muscle. And finally, within the joint, it gives the tendon of long head of the biceps brachii. Moving on to the blood supply, to the shoulder joint, we have the anterior circumflex humeral vessels, the posterior circumflex humeral vessels, the suprascapular vessels and finally the subscapular vessels. The nerve supply to the shoulder joint is by the axillary nerve, the musculocutaneous nerve and the suprascapular nerve. Nextly, let's look at the movements of the shoulder joint. We have flexion and extension movements, abduction and adduction. And finally, medial and lateral rotation. Looking at the flexion and extension movement, during flexion, the arm moves forwards and medially. During extension, the arm moves backwards and laterally. Flexion and extension take place in a plane parallel to the surface of the glenoid cavity. During flexion, the arm moves forwards and medially. Medially means towards the body. During extension, the arm moves backwards and laterally. Laterally means away from the body. Looking at the abduction and adduction movement, it takes place at right angles to the plane of flexion and extension, that is midway between the sagittal and coronal planes. In abduction, the arm moves anterolaterally away from the trunk. During abduction, the arm moves laterally away from the trunk. Looking at the medial and lateral rotation movements, they are the best demonstrated in a mid-flexed elbow. The hand is moved medially across the chest in a medial rotation and laterally in lateral rotation of the shoulder joint. 
this is the mid flexed position of the elbow and this is medial rotation this is lateral rotation now let's move on to look at the muscles which bring about movement at the shoulder joint firstly let's look at the movement of flexion the main muscles involved in flexion is the clavicular head of the pectoralis major and the anterior fibers of the deltoid and the accessory muscles are the coracobrachialis and the short head of the biceps brachii this is the pectoralis major this is the deltoid this is the short head of the biceps brachii this is the coracobrachialis muscle now the main muscles involved in extension include the posterior fibers of the deltoid the latissimus dorsi and the accessory muscles include the teres major and the long head of the triceps brachii this is the posterior fiber of the deltoid this is the latissimus dorsi this is the short head of the biceps brachii this is the teres major muscle the adduction movement involves the main muscles of the pectoralis major latissimus dorsi short head of the biceps and short head of the triceps the accessory muscles include the teres major and the coracobrachialis in abduction movement the main muscles include the supraspinatus and deltoid from 0 degree to 90 degree of abduction then the serratus anterior muscle from 90 degree to 180 degree of abduction and finally the upper and lower fibers of the trapezius from 90 to 180 degree of abduction this is the supraspinatus muscle this is the serratus anterior right here and here we have the trapezius muscle in medial rotation the main muscles involved are pectoralis major anterior fibers of deltoid latissimus dorsi and teres major and the accessory muscle is subscapularis finally in lateral rotation the main muscles involved are posterior fibers of deltoid the infraspinatus and the teres minor finally let's look at some clinical anatomy associated with the shoulder joint three important conditions are dislocation shoulder tip pain and frozen shoulder let's look at dislocation first the shoulder joint is more prone to dislocation than any other joint due to the laxity of the capsule and disproportionate area of the articular surfaces the dislocation usually occurs when the arm is abducted it endangers the axillary nerve closely related to the lower part of the joint capsule next in shoulder tip pain the irritation of the peritoneum underlying the diaphragm from any surrounding pathology causes referred pain in the shoulder this is because the phrenic nerve carrying impulses from the peritoneum and the supraclavicular nerve supplying the skin of the shoulder have the same root value finally in frozen shoulder two layers of the synovial membrane adhere to each other causing pain in the shoulder stiffness in the joint and restriction of movement i hope you found this video helpful To get updates on my latest videos, click on the subscribe button. To get notifications, tap on the bell icon. Thank you for watching.